Dear guests, uh, I had the pleasure to welcome you to this seminar on, on older people and the climate, which is organized by the Nordic Council of Ministers through the uh, Icelandic Ministry for Environment, uh, Energy and Resources. And I just want in the beginning to welcome all of you. It's a great pleasure to have you here with us, uh, representing most of the Nordic countries, all of the countries actually. We are only missing Greenland and the Holland Islands. And I'll come back with some practical stuff later on. But it's a great pleasure for me and uh, honor to, to welcome uh, the President of Iceland, Mr. Guðni Johansson, to the podium. And he will say a few words to give us some, some inspiration into these two days of work ahead. Gjør så vel, Guðni. Já, takk fyrir Stefán og kæru vinir, kæra vennar, dear guests. Welcome to Iceland. Welcome, especially those who have come from abroad. It's a pleasure and honor to have you here. I hope you will enjoy your stay. I hope the people of Iceland will treat you nicely. If not, let me know. <laughs> there was a time when we would have tried to ask you this question, this very deep, important question, at least for us. And it's like this. How do you like Iceland? This question was asked to practically everyone who came to Iceland's shores. In the old days, when some of the Icelanders here were young, speaking of, you know, old age, there was a time when we here in Iceland were not necessarily sure, too sure about ourselves. Can we do it? Can we survive on our own? Iceland is a young country, only 16 million years old. <laughs> the island itself. People arrived here just over a thousand years ago or so to settle. And the Republic of Iceland is only 79 years old. That's about, you know, the life expectancy of a, of a normal Icelander. So we're young in so many senses. And a few decades ago, yes, how do you like Iceland? We wanted the positive answer. We wanted the positive confirmation. Yes, I love it. I love the country. I love the people. I love the history. I love the sagas. Of course, we hope that you still like Iceland. Of course, we hope you will have a lovely time here. But we're not asking you this question, dear guests from abroad. Well, to begin with, there's just too many of you. We can't stop everyone at the border, at the airport, at the harbor, and ask whether you like Iceland or not. There are over 2 million tourists expected this year in an island where under 400,000 people live. And secondly, and I hope that is also true, I think we have grown in self-confidence. We don't need the reassurance from you abroad that Iceland is great. And one example of this is this conference, this very conference, that we feel that we can contribute to the debate. But equally important, I think it is important that we learn from others. So when it comes to senior citizens and the climate, I think that we here in Iceland have a lot to learn from activists abroad, from people who have uh, thought about this, maybe more than we do. And therefore, we are here to listen, not only to speak or lecture. Therefore, my talk will be brief. I'm not going to uh, give a monologue about uh, the climate, the environment, and older people. But I mentioned briefly, yes, our culture, our history, the sagas. Uh, Aging is mentioned there, not necessarily in a positive light. Maybe you will find the time to read the saga of Eitl, saga of Eitl Skallagrimsson, who lived uh, an interesting life. He killed a few people, ventured far, was a Viking. But what happens to old Vikings? It happens the same to them as happens or can happen to others. You lose your agility, 
mobility, you become old and frail. And how do you counter that? Maybe Eyjit would have benefited from some kind of advice about how to tackle old age. In the saga of Eyjit, and I'm afraid I, can't, I don't remember it from heart, there is a section where he is reminiscing about all the people he slayed far and wide, all the gold he gathered, raiding monasteries and places all over Europe. But now he's just old and frail, sitting by the fire, and it goes like this in the saga. Uh, once when Eyjit went to the fire to warn himself, a man asked him whether his feet were cold and warned him not to put them too near the fire. That shall be so, said Eyjit, but it's not easy steering my feet now that I cannot see. A very dismal thing is blindness. So this is the description of aging in these sagas. But, and maybe some of you know this much better than I do, aging can be a wonderful process. Well, I'm 55. I still think I'm young. Uh, but I know that if I'm fortunate enough, I will be able to enjoy longevity. And I am determined to relax as hard as I can, enjoy every minute. And if I lose my sight, if my feet are cold, I know that we, I will have a society and a family to help me. So that will be the difference from the saga of Eyjit. But you cannot revert, you cannot resist aging. And there's another example of that I want to mention in conclusion, because we have a description of that, a wonderful description in, uh, in oh, it's called in Iceland, the Gilva Ginning, the beguiling of Gilvi, king in Sweden. And uh, it's a wonderful tale where Thor, the god of thunder, goes on a journey with his, what he thinks is his friend, Loki, now, you may know these characters from the Avengers movies. Yes, Thor is there, very prominent, and Loki as well. And by the way, it is Loki, not Loki, as they pronounce it in Hollywood. <laughs> but they are on this journey, and Thor is presented with all kinds of challenges, because he's a strong guy. He's still, you know, in his prime. And one of the challenges includes seeing and detesting himself against others. And uh, one of the challenges, uh, which he thinks initially will be very easy for him, is to fight with an old lady that Loki challenges him to uh, wrestle with. And as he says, Loki, uh, I see no ma such man here within who would not hold it a disgrace to wrestle with thee. It is all in Old English. You have to bear with me, the translation. And yet he said, let us see first. Let the old woman, my nurse, be called hither, Etli. And I have to give you some hint. Etli in Icelandic is old age, aging. Let Thor wrestle with her, if he will. Straightway there came into the hall an old woman, stricken in years. Then Loki said that she should grapple with Thor. There is no need to make a long matter of it. That struggle went in such wise that the harder Thor strove in gripping, the faster she stood. Then the old woman essayed a hold, and then Thor became totty on his feet. And their tuckings were very hard. Yet it was not long before Thor fell to his knee on one foot. And this had never happened before. Thor had never given way. Thor had never lost. But he had to surrender. He could not fight Edli. He could not beat old age. But then, I don't know if there's a moral in the story. I haven't really thought it that far. But let's just enjoy the, the uh, struggle and the survival and the cohabitance with old age. And 
Furthermore, I think that as we grow older, we still have and should make a contribution in society. Uh, there is a saying in Icelandic, uh, let the youth learn from the old. And that holds true. I think those who are younger, to, younger than us in age can have a lot to learn from us. But I think it shouldn't only work that way. I think we should also have a saying, hvað gamall nemur ungur temur. Let the, let the uh, youth, yeah, let, uh, let the old learn from the young. Because it works both ways. I think the fewer artificial barricades, the fewer artificial barriers we construct in society, the better. Let everyone contribute on his or own terms, regardless of age, regardless of gender, regardless of whatever parameters we find. We will all do so much better as a society. So I think that you, senior citizens in the Nordic countries, can and should have a contribution to make in a matter that maybe concerns the young more than we think it concerns us, because, you know, the, the fight with Etli is closer for us than it seems to them. But they will also not be able to escape. They will not beat Etli. And uh, therefore, I think it's important that we do this all together. And that's why I think it's so important to have a conference of this kind. And he says now, having spoken longer than he thought, uh, I think it's timely that we start also listening, we here in Iceland, about what you dear guests from abroad have to say, both here and online. Uh, I will not be with you all the time. I have to leave to my, I have to go to my residence where senior citizens await me, good people from Reykjavik who are on a tour, and I have to give them pancakes and coffee. <laughs> but it is an honor to be with you here, and I wish you all a safe stay in Iceland and a good journey back home, and uh, look forward to at least listening to one or two presentations here today. Thank you very much. Tak fyrir. Thank you so much for this opening speech, Mr. President Guðni. It's really a pleasure to have you here with us. And as he said, he will stay for a couple of, couple of minutes, couple of presentations, and, until he has to leave to do to, to other jobs. Uh, now we have a short uh, presentation from the Ministry for uh, Environment, Cl uh, Energy and Climate. And it's Hatla Sigrun Sigurdóttir. She is the director for strategy and implementation in the ministry. Hatla, floor is yours. Good uh, morning, Mr. President, dear guests. How very happy we are to see you here. And I bring you the regards from the Ministry of Environment, Energy and Climate. Uh, I grew up in a farm in North Iceland, in Skagafjörður. Without any doubt, the most beautiful countryside of Iceland. My parents, who were born in 1936 and 1932, bred the fields there, kept cows, sheep, horses, a dog and a cat, and lived on what Mother Earth provided. They were full of respect for the land and its harvest, mm -hmm. the products from the animals feeding on the earth and the potatoes that grew from it. To them, it was impossible, impossible for to waste anything. Every part, particle of a meat or vegetable was used to the fullest. Leftovers were put in the fridge and eaten later, and bones and fish skin ended up in the pet's feeding bowl. This efficiency and frugality applied not only to food, but to, but to everything else in everything, everyday life. When the washing machine and or toaster broke, the first thought was always to repair. The children inherited the clothing from the old assembling, and I was the youngest of six. <laughs> and if a single-use plastic can was brought into the house, it was immediately put into use as a container for odds and ends. 
Uh, I can see some of you nodding already. And my guess is that you are probably quite familiar with some of the scenario that I've put out here. You are of the generation that were and are experts in efficiency. It is therefore particularly placing that this generation is taking an active part in the climate issue because, because to succeed we all need to learn exactly that, efficiency. The climate crisis is basically, if I simplify things quite a lot, a result of the fact that with increased prosperity, the man has forgotten these old and important values, which means that our lifestyles are not sustainable anymore. This sincere desire to leave future generations a habitable earth to inherit is admir admirable. One can say that the climate issue is a struggle of different generations, whether, whether young or old, but it is a battle where not only the young people will enjoy the experience that older people have, but can also be the other way around, just like our president said. And I think he had a sneak into my speech when he said, what ungur nemur gamall temur, the older people will learn from the way of the young, and I totally agree that it can be the other way around. I know that many older people and many of you here have been inspired and encouraged by one of the most renowned young Nordic citizens of our time, Greta Thunberg. And I know attending this seminar are even representatives from an organization that identifies itself with this fighter, referring to Greta's Gamlingar in Sweden. And that makes sense. Many of today's older people are full of fighting spirit, many of whom are tough activists, burning to get the climate crisis under control. And many in your group also possess valuable knowledge, education and experience, which is so important to activate. We are currently facing rapid and complex environmental changes. The development of the climate environment throughout the century is full of uncertainties. What we can be assured of, that there will be a lot of changes ahead, and we have already seen a lot of changes. The climate that you experienced as children will never come back in our lifetimes. It is therefore important to ensure the participation of those with the longest experience of human life in years when we need to prepare ourselves for the future, whether with regards to alertness, education or policy. We need to think about vulnerable groups in our society and that the changes that are being made are as just as possible. I mentioned earlier that young campaigners have been an inspiration to older generation in dealing with the climate emergency. I would like to add that you are an insp inspiration to us all who work every day in this field. It is good to know that there are fellow soldiers in this fight and we definitely need you. I for sure hope that when I'm, a senior, when I'm senior in years, retired and maybe back in my good old countryside, I will follow in your footsteps and do my part to make the world a better place. So best of luck for today and tomorrow, and thank you. Thank you, Hatla. Uh, now we'll turn over to uh, a lady who's based in Switzerland. She will have the third and the last uh, address in this opening session of this seminar. Uh, I'm talking about Elisabeth Stern, who is representing a group of uh, ladies in Switzerland who call themselves uh, Klima Senurin and Schweiz. Um, they have been known throughout Europe before, because of their court case against the Swiss government, uh, that they are now uh, move, moving to the European Court of Human Rights, and they are expecting some results from there at the end of the year, if I'm right. But anyway, I'll not uh, explain in details what Elizabeth Stern is going to tell you, but I'm sure she will explain why are they 
uh, fighting the Swiss government. What has the Swiss government done wrong or what didn't they do right? And how it is going. So I'm very pleased to welcome Elisabeth Stern all the way from Schweiz. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for letting me participate via Zoom. I'm much obliged because none of us Klimaseniorin is flying anymore, not for health reasons, but because air traffic contributes to global emissions. And that's exactly uh, to that problem, which we want to cut down to make it smaller. I heard all these things about old age. Well, to feel young at 55, that's wonderful. I remember when that was, that's 20 years ago. And I also know about the saying by Petty, Betty Davis, age is not for sissies. And at my age, that's definitely uh, true. Okay. So we are, as of today, we are almost two and a half thousand Klima in uh, Switzerland. We are part of a wave of uh, climate litigation. Switzerland has the same problem as almost all other countries have. The sooner it works that the internationally agreed level of 1.5 degrees global warming can be implemented nationally by every single nation, the more likely is the chance for a livable planet, for a future worth living, to a safe level because we have reached already plus 1.2 degrees global warming worldwide and we a, world, a worldwide average and we see already enormous damages plus the most vulnerable groups in the global south mostly mothers with their children are already losing their homes and forced to leave oh sorry i go the wrong direction um here <laughs> It's a photo of some of these two and a half thousand. Now, when you look at this card, it actually should be like Switzerland. <laughs> um, you see how the hot years, the heat waves have increased. You know, very often people tell you, well, there were hot weathers. And my mother certainly, when she was pregnant with me in 1947, she has complained about that almost until she died, how hot it was and how unbearable. And finally, you were born and got rid of, got rid of you. But you see, the development is unfortunately very obvious. So here were more colder years, and then it started getting hotter and hotter and we have more heat waves uh, the most where almost 1000 people died in switzerland just because of the heat um the temperature increase in switzerland is already now 2.2 uh, celsius compared to pre-industrial levels and Many more heat waves followed after 2003, 2015, 1820, 2022, and there were more women than men who actually died. And this is um, the, yeah, this is where it started for us. This group agenda. Uh, they took the government to court and they won the case. And this was in 2010 already. There were 900 civilians. They sued the state for inaction and non-compliance with the Paris Agreement. And then the Supreme Court of Holland of the Netherlands confirmed that plaintiffs can indeed invoke the Paris Convention even though it does not contain individually enforced rights. 
It also confirmed that the Dutch constitution obliges the government to keep the land habitable. It was an inspire. It, it was an inspiration for many climate uh, people around Europe, and it was the starting point for our lawsuit in uh, 2014. So we started in November 2016. We sent a legal request to our government, arguing that they are simply not doing enough, that they are putting our lives and health at risk. But our government did not listen to us. So um, they certainly did not believe that we were specifically uh, affected. And the ruling that they did is in clear conflict with overwhelming scientific evidence. Regarding heat waves, elder people and particularly elder women are clearly more at risk for severe health problems and death, which is confirmed in the meantime by many more epidemiological data. And that is why we decided to take the case to the federal court. So this was first just a question to to the government in itself. Uh, so we took it to the uh, to the court, and we were dismissed three times. Uh, we were turned out on different reasons, like. We are not the only ones affected. Everybody is affected, even winter tourism. And another, uh, another time, the next court uh, said, well, 1.5 degrees global warming has not been reached yet. You can complain later and not now. So how about prevention? Switzerland has very strong notions about prevention. We don't build... Uh, protection against avalanches when they have hit the village already. We try to do it before, and that's very much in our mind. Uh, and that, another reason for dismissing us, that our intention is not to improve emissions in our own country, as if emissions with no country borders, but worldwide. And this is a, a so-called Octio Popularis, which means a group action, and that is not allowed. So, unfortunately, waiting until safe levels would be exceeded, until, until we are above 1.5, would give us no chance whatsoever to reverse the damaging development anymore. Uh, so then, we knew that we needed to get the gear up. We say uh, really to turn the heat up to get into a higher gear. So we had it on to the European Court of Human Rights, our last hope. And in December of 2020, we put in our final submission. And we got the green light uh, already four months later, which surprised us. Switzerland called so much longer for an answer. This suggested uh, that the court recognizes the importance and urgency of this case. We are, by the way, the second climate case at the court that got so-called communicated. By the way, right now, today, there is the public hearing in Strasbourg. who are putting in a complaint as a green light, our government finally has to react to our arguments, which they did not do. Then the next step were these third party interventions. And I tell you that 95% of all complaints that ha are get handed in in Strasbourg are being sent back because of formal procedure reasons. And that we even got so far it's just a miracle in itself. 
Uh, so not only lots of changes between us and Switzerland took place, but also other parties got involved. Uh, to help the court to clarify important questions of climate change, not to support us. That is uh, not the meaning. Then, I see already, I have to hurry, the Grand Chamber. That was really a sensation to us, that we were passed on right away to this uh, Grand Chamber. And the meaning of this chamber is is uh, important because it raises severe questions uh, for the Convention on Human Rights. You know, when the, when the Convention was uh, written in 46, nobody thought about climate change. I mean, of course there is nothing in it. So now the court will have to deliver a, a, a ruling uh, on that. Then, lots of questions back and forth. We had to enlarge our team from two to five. Then, this March was the public hearing. A great moment for us. Um, but when a final judgment will be, nobody knows. It's all speculation. We hope by the end of the year, it can be next year. So, what happens next? In the worst case, our complaint is being completely dismissed. The judges thus would say that climate protection is not a human right, and that climate is, in terms of human rights, a legal vacuum. Although the climate represents the environmental restriction with the most severe effects on human rights as such, and also a dismissal would have negative effects on the implementation of positive climate protection that have already uh, been taken. In the best case, our complaint would be fully approved. The Swiss government would have to set reduced emissions a target way below the present ones, which are not safe for the health of the population. The judges could also state that climate protection is a human right. That's the big question. Now, this ruling would serve as a guiding judgment for all 46 member states of the Council of Europe, not to confuse with the European Union. Sometimes that still happens. And most likely, it might have a, uh, an effect uh, worldwide. Now, while we are waiting, yes, we have learned patience. We have had to practice it for the last seven years. Uh, we, pay, we wait patiently, but not inactive. Certainly not in the rocking chair. And here are just a few examples. We receive countless uh, invitations for public talks. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we do them. Videos are produced about us. We, at the invitation of local climate groups, we also go to foreign countries and only within Europe, now flying by train, bus. Now you can say, well, yes, to Greece from Switzerland, it takes almost two days. And yes, only retired people can do that. That's true. Okay, then uh, the melting glaciers are a big topic in Switzerland. So we take um, private people, usually together with the press. This is Art and ZDF. Uh, up to the mountains uh, to discuss about the melting uh, uh, glaciers. Now, what is very nice is if other groups also voluntarily promote you. Imagine there were 350 posters that were put in all trams and buses in the city of Zurich for a whole month. This was last December. And these are women from our uh, board with their grandchildren or their student, or I am with my youngest godchild. And it they all have some saying uh, that indicates they want to take care of the environment in the future. And here, 
there is a QR code and here you learn more about the us uh, Klima Seniorin. Also, <laughs> a wonderful poster from uh, Tanzania, from Dar es Salaam, wonderfully done by school children there. Now, here you find all the key dates and documents if you are further interested. And now, I thank you for listening. That's it. <laughs> thank you so much for this interesting introduction, Elizabeth. I'm sure we are all uh, inspired by this. Maybe we will also file some cases against our governments, or at least we will follow what happens in the European Courts of Human Rights, hopefully before the end of the year. And I'm sure, as Elizabeth said, that it will have some impact, uh, whatever the decision will be. Uh, you maybe noticed that she was showing the uh, development in temperature from month to month, from year to year. And I don't know if you see this sign I have in my jacket. These are the climate stripes. It's an invention by uh, Ed Hawkins at the University of Reading. It's, no, as he says, no words, no numbers, just some stripes, blue stripes, red stripes. The, blue, the darkest blue stripes show the highest deviation to, the, to colder levels, and the red stripes are the more hot years. So each stripe represents one year, a medium temperature for one year, from 1850 to 2020, 2023 even. So this is very small and you might not see it, but the development is pretty obvious and it's pretty scary from colder years to hotter years in the very most recent history. And now we have uh, some time. Uh, we, we will have a break until two o'clock or five minutes past two. Uh, I will come back by then with some more practical information. These, through, these three speeches we already had are sort of setting the focus for the day and for tomorrow. And we will build on that in the sessions we will start with at two o'clock or five past two. So any, any questions before we? Uh, may I just ask you, uh, will you send us the presentations uh, afterward, after the, the session? Mm. Yeah, the question is whether we will send out the presentations or, or publish them maybe on the website or something. We will do that uh, if the uh, presenters allow us to do it, because we have all of them, that is all of them that are written, there are some unwritten as well, but we have all of them with us and we just need to ask for permission. So we, could, we can share it with you with the permission of the authors of the speakers. Yeah, we will. I'll, I'll, I'll I give my permission. Yeah, yeah, she just saved some time. Uh, Elizabeth is still online, so maybe if you have some questions to her, it, it might be possible to put them through because we, have, we still have some five minutes left of our original schedule with her. Is there any, any simple, uh, quick questions, Kira? Uh, Elizabeth, I, I, I could not hear it. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I supposed you didn't hear, so I'll, I'll repeat it very shortly. The question is, how, how the hell, <laughs> I could say, uh, mm -hmm. are you in, have you managed to engage the press in what you're doing? As Kira <laughs> said, she's coming from Denmark, she said, if, if young people are doing something, the press seems to be interested, they will be there. But when old people or people our age, like seniors, mm -hmm. are doing something, mm -hmm. it's very hard to mm -hmm. get the attention of the press. So how, how did you manage to bring all this, uh, to get all this attention? <laughs> it's an interesting question because we wonder ourselves. You know, at the beginning in 2016, we were these funny old women 
nobody took us uh, serious. Actually, we got bad letters saying that one should take away the old age pension from us. And somehow over the last seven years, this changed completely to us old women being agents of social change, that we are now the ones because you can only uh, take your government to court when you are personally affected by something. And now we stick our head out and we say, well, we are old women and we are more affected than any other population group. This was at the beginning a joke, and now slowly, slowly, people see us as heroines. <laughs> and we, the, the press is crazy. When we were going for the public hearing in uh, Strasbourg, already in Basel, we were only about 12 women that traveled together from there on that train. But there were more media with cameras around us than than the 12 of us. So I don't know. We actually don't know. We gave lots of interviews because we were asked. I don't know how that happened. But the press, we have about 146 articles as of now, only in Switzerland and over 100 abroad. And I don't think we caught all of them. And then I think once it goes in the right direction, you know, then you have that exponential growth. And we were not, we are nice women and we were active all our lives. It's not just that we became old and now we started complaining, oh, it's too hot. No, all of us were active all their lives, be it the women movement, the environmental movement at that time, saving some area in Switzerland from the military, uh, anti-nuke protests. We were all our lives uh, active. And maybe that also drew some interest because they wanted to know our own biography. By the way, I also grew up on a farm. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I, maybe I should add to that because I was reading a little bit this and that about their work on the internet. So that just if you try to Google Klima Senorin, you will find basically a full internet of information. And I guess especially linked to this uh, court case uh, at, the human, at the European Court of Human Rights. It, it gains a lot of media attention and, and maybe yeah. so, you know, and some of the large media like the Guardian, they're writing about this. Everyone is writing about this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really gaining attention on the international level. I, I can confirm that because I checked it out. Uh, any more quick questions to, to Elizabeth? Kira, will you add to your? There's just uh, one thing. Where are the men? You're women. <laughs> are there men in Switzerland not engaged in climate activism? Because it's not very good. <laughs> what? Vos, vos I didn't men. hear it. <laughs> Where are the men? <laughs> She's asking. It's only, only, yes. only ladies who are interested in this. Uh, no, but we are asked this a lot, whether we hate men, why we don't have me men as members. We have them as supporters, specifically our own partners, <laughs> husbands. But yes, because women are more affected by these heat waves, that is how we can complain against the government. Now, men would have to do their own thing, but they cannot part of our complaint because then it's not anymore this special uh, being affected. Okay. Well, special, it's not special. It's just what in reality is true. There is a group in Switzerland quite active called Grandparents uh, for the Climate. And there, of course, are mixed men and women. Okay? And actually, to add to that, most of the Nordic countries have a group of this kind. And I know uh, they are, or you are, people in here, some of you are involved in creating mm -hmm. and establishing a European network. Of, of these That's organizations. Right. So, yes. Yeah, it, it's quite promising from my point of view to be a little bit so I take, yeah, I shouldn't take sight in anything, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes. 
I guess this is about it for, for now. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Elizabeth Stern, for your, your input. And as I said before, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure uh, most of us are quite impressed. So let's give her a hand and then we take a break. Okay. Well, thank you very much and I say goodbye now. Bye bye. So let, let's take some coffee. Let's, let's uh, mingle a little bit. Let's uh, yeah, loosen up, take some steps, and we'll be back five minutes past two. Det är det du.
Okay. Let's take a seat. 
do as I do with my children. I sound like like an owl. Bounce owl. It it always works. I used to do on my children when they were young. Okay, it, it, it's time to carry on with our next session. And uh, so please take a seat. Please take a seat and turn on full attention. I said before I'm, I will come back with some more practical stuff after having these three interesting uh, introduction speeches. Uh, the first not so interesting stuff is I, I haven't introduced myself yet. Maybe you know I'm Stefan Kislason. I'm director of Environize, who is responsible for this workshop on behalf of the Ministry for the Environment, uh, Energy and Climate. And it's all financed by the Nordic Council of Ministers, as you are, are aware of. And it's also done in cooperation with the Ministry for social issues and and uh, Arbeitsmarktsministeriet. I don't remember the English word <laughs> at the moment. Uh, social and labor issues. And uh, we will now have uh, three presentations. And at the, when they have finished, we have uh, hopefully 10 minutes of panel discussions. So we will, keep, we will keep all questions until the panel. So the three who will be presenting next, they will stand up there when the panel starts, and then you can uh, send your questions to them through Slito, Slito. And maybe you have already seen or, or, or found the Slito link. Uh, there is a sheet of paper on the table in front of me where you can use the QR code to get into the Slito, or otherwise, uh, there is a link. I'm not, I'm not asking you to remember this link, but you should find it also in the Facebook event. You can click that link to get into Slido. In Slido, we can choose the different sessions or the different panels. So now we are entering first panel on day one, and you can uh, enter your questions there, or you can vote for the questions that might be there already. So the panel goes like that. I'll try to manage the whole thing and be the facilitator, and I will uh, ask the panel members to reply to the questions that have got most votes on Slido. So please write in your, find, find the Slido, write in your questions and vote for the questions of others, so to maximize the possibility that the most important questions will be answered. And as I said, I, I'll I'll, I'll be here trying to keep everything on track, and my, my most uh, demanding task will to keep the time schedule. Each presenter only has 15 minutes, and I'm already spending the first minutes of the first presenter in this session, so I'll not tell you any more at this point. We have a, po we have a uh, break at 3 o'clock, and then we have some coffee. But until then, we, we should keep our attention and listen to the speakers. And I'll, I'll start to introduce uh, a member of Greta Skamlingar, uh, Greta's oldies in Sweden, Erik Elvers. And he will tell us how it all started and what are the experiences. And I'll now find this presentation and bring it to the screen. Um, Varsågod, Erik. Thank you. Allting, är, allting står här. <laughs> and welcome. My name then is Erik Elvers. And if you have any questions to me after the lecture, then you have my email address. And uh, you may send it out as, much as, you, as you wish. And so questions after the lectures. Uh, if I start talk, talking too fast, which I often do, or if my English is too bad, then please interrupt me at once, so I, I will try again. <clears throat> and the first question was, how did you start? You're, of course, uh, all of you well familiar with the name Greta Thunberg uh, and her school strike for climate, which she started in August uh, 2018, 
who had general elections in September that year, and she was worried about um, the, the low interest from the politicians on the climate questions, um, <coughs> as they are so, so important. So we started uh, sitting out of the parliament building uh, in central Stockholm at no, noon every Friday with a school strike for climate. <coughs> and so after one year about, um, it was a group of oldies, <coughs> senior citizens in a small borough in the island of Gotland who still were worried and thought the politicians don't do anything. So they gathered in the central place the, in that small borough <coughs> with signs, uh, so be careful with the planet, take care of, of, the, uh, of the planet, uh, of the, the climate, and so on. And um, that idea uh, spread so all over Sweden. We are not um, ma many groups, not, not at all. I think about 15 groups uh, right now with in total maybe 1,000 participants. Uh, this is a network or a set of networks. It's no formal organization. So there is no, no board, no uh, st statutes, no laws for, for the moment. It's just a net network. And we can try to keep in touch uh, using email and so social media. Personally, I do not on Facebook. I rely on um, the, the emails. But I might mention at once that there is one disadvantage uh, with email list, <clears throat> since uh, there might be uh, several versions of a list in so-called my group, um, there is at least two versions, and uh, which I wasn't aware of. Uh, I was on one version, but not on the other one, so I missed some inf information. So if you uh, have that uh, use for com communication uh, with the members or with the participants, be aware of uh, just one list should be valid. Uh, as I said, about uh, 15 groups uh, spreading from small villages like this, for example, Burtsvik in the island of Gotland to Stockholm. Uh, I live in a suburb of Stockholm, or so maybe even, one might say, in a suburb of that suburb, in a very small part of the suburb Solna to Stockholm. Um, but there is a group Page down there. Yeah. So <clears throat> all the groups uh, work in the same way. We gather in some central place in the place wh where we live, uh, Friday at noon, <clears throat> and we have some kind of uh, aprons so to show how we are. Greta's gamlingar or Greta's oldies. Um, and as a uh, talk with people who are passing by, um, we gather outside uh, one of the two so food stores in Bersamra, which is the name of the suburb of the suburb. So there can be some quite a lot of people who are passing by. I should not say that all of them are interested in our message, but um, the group is growing, uh, mostly women, but not, not, not only them. And say the climate is <clears throat> one of the slogans. Um, both the president <clears throat> and the representative from the, um, the department had old Icelandic sayings. And in a matter of fact, I also have one which I saw many years ago. You'll take it first in English, in the Icelandic, and then in English. And in Icelandic, uh, some of you will probably recognize it. If Icecan will get us your urban to hunt, so I do a frontier way. If the youth will give you a helping hand, then you are on the road to, to or for, for the future. Do you agree? Good. And uh, <clears throat> this is um, maybe uh, as well as they also said in the opposite way. So we, the oldest, are giving a helping hand to the youth since we think uh, that they are on, on the, the way to, to the future. And uh, they will, of course, be some more affected by the effects of the climate change, change than we, the oldest, are. Um, but we have said it's not only an altruistic, altruistic, also an egoistical 
since uh, old people are more affected by rising te temperatures than younger people are. So it is a co common interest for all of us. And what we think that we can do, what, what we can contribute with uh, for, for the young people um, is that um, we have more time to search facts, uh, write letters to, through the papers, and, and so on, than young people are. We have more e experience. So we do hope that we have something to, to, to give the, the young people. And um, <clears throat> what we wish is um, that the politicians is, um, should be more aware of these questions. We, we think we all, at least many of us, are warm friends of the representative democracy. Um, and I personally, I feel a bit sorry since if we have chosen some uh, politicians with bad ideas, which I think that we have now in Sweden, but they have a majority. And uh, I think that, uh, I can't say that I know this much better than the major majority of the Swedes. I think we have to say, <coughs> we have chosen them and have to say, follow that, that decisions. Also, I think that many decisions are very bad. Uh, and so we will say, um, meet um, every Friday in this central place, this place or, or another one in Beisamra. Um, <coughs> we uh, have had uh, st 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 study groups, st study circles. Um, <coughs> um, we have uh, presented um, a book gathered, uh, prepared by Greta Thunberg. This Greta is, of course, Greta Thunberg. Um, the, the climate book, which we have given uh, to all um, the members in, in the parliament, to, to local po politicians, to some pu public service journalists, in hope to get uh, <coughs> uh, more interest for, for it, more, more knowledge about it. M many of us are between 70 and 80 years old. Uh, and many of us are reluctant, so have not much experience of taking part in de demonstrations and so on. But it was a demonstration about two weeks ago in Stockholm um, with 550 senior citizens walking for the climate. Um, I think twice as many as last year. Um, all the Gigi, also uh, Greta's Gamlinger, Greta's oldest groups, I will say Gigi maybe. Uh, all the groups are independent of each other, but keep in touch using e email. And the representatives meet once a year, meet either physically or by Zoom, like here, to avoid traveling as much as, as possible. <coughs> um, uh, we had uh, new uh, general elections lo last year, uh, and um, my group, if I call it my, my group, I mean, I'm not a leading person by, by no means, but um, we had uh, um, uh, meetings with politicians from most of the political parties and asked them, what would you, you do on the local level <coughs> if you get the power uh, to, uh, for, for, to in, in, in the border council? And uh, man, many of the part, parties were so genuinely interested in w what we did. Um, that was the apron I showed. And what we wish to do, strengthen the opinion for action against climate change, of course, and emphasize what we can do as indi individuals. As I say, no one can do everything. All of us can do something. So we encourage people not by going by air, but by train, um, to <coughs> uh, repair uh, instead of buying new repair or reuse, um, some kind of cir cir circular e economy. And the public meetings of the circle I, I mentioned. <clears throat> and this, uh, discussions with the political parties once again, demonstration of the Swedish parliament building. 
And we are also in cooperation, lobbying together with the WWF, World Wildlife Fund, the 3D Society for uh, Nature Protection, and uh, some of the uh, senior citizens' uh, societies. Uh, and one of us, our members has prepared <coughs> um, a stuff for a study circle in those um, uh, senior citizens' um, fellowships. You may look, and look on it if you like afterwards. It, it is, of course, in uh, Swedish, but um, it has a lot of ideas and uh, pointing out what can just you do. Uh, I think it's very good, and it is already is, um, is in use in the, some, uh, of lo some local societies. How much time have I, have I left? Uh, two minutes. Two, okay. I will um, hurry on. And so, <clears throat> so we will um, make these uh, uh, senior citizens such as more interested in this important question instead of uh, as some say, playing bull and bridge and ma making w walks. Um, try to uh, do thing, something more uh, important. Yes, as uh, you talked uh, with the local food stores about ecological and nearby produce goods, and uh, once again, how they recycle their uh, materials, uh, the, the, they get the goods in, and um, um, <coughs> encouraging, encourage, encouraging them to sell the stuff with a close time to best before rate instead of throwing it away, as we also can do ourselves, uh, not throwing anything but uh, use it. And I think that um, that has had some effect. Maybe it's, uh, I may, but uh, I think it, it has worked as the talks with them. Yes, we have got a response from the local political parties and the food stores, and they are getting more and more participants in our meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much. Now we'll turn to Finland, and we have our next presentations from there, from the organization Activist in Mimot. Uh, sorry for my pronunciation. And uh, the, the one who is uh, telling us about their work and the Nordic and global health consequences of the climate issues is Helena Karjaina. Sorry for my pronunciation once again. So I'll just, uh, sorry, find out. It's here. Um. Yes. And it's from? Just this one. Oh, sorry. Okay. Hey, it's up uh, here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, I'm really grateful to the organizers that this has happened, and I'm looking very much forward to what happens afterwards when we have built this network. So I was asked to talk about uh, health consequences related to climate and environmental uh, crisis, uh, because in addition to being an activist granny, I'm also um, a member of uh, Physicians for Climate, uh, group in Finland. I think there are similar groups everywhere in, in the world. But first I want to talk something about uh, activist grannies, activist mummot. Uh, we started um, about four years ago and of course for us also uh, Greta was a great inspiration. It was hard to think that such kids have to be responsible for the fate of the world and so we thought that we have to do something. And we had a very strong start because uh, we, when we had just opened our web page and started for nearly four years ago, the biggest newspaper in Finland, Helsingin Sanomat, wanted to make a sort of half-page um, thing about us. And, and so, so we, we were very happy to have such a strong start. And that was uh, partly because some of us, for instance, Evis and Seija in this picture, uh, have been and 
still more or less are uh, professional uh, com com what you call it communications professionals so we have very strong um, uh, way of working with with a uh, with a uh, press for instance um, we have had some i think five seminars but mainly we are active in the social media and we calculate because in our Facebook you have to register if you want to comment there, so we know that there are nearly 7,000 members in our Facebook, and when we add Twitter and Instagram, I think that we are something like 10,000 at the moment grandmothers, but there are also grandpapas in the group. Um, our values uh, are hope and moderation. We don't say that let's never consume anything, but we say that let's take it down. And then we try to be empathetic and listen to those who have different opinions. And actually, I think that the name activisti mummot has been a very clever invention because mummo is such a word that nobody can say anything bad to mummos. It's, it's a good word in Finland. And it means somebody who has the baby in, in the lap and reads a story and maybe makes cakes. So even in Twitter, which is such an aggressive uh, place, we have not had any aggression. So that has been good. We have had several campaigns. The green one is um, from our first campaign where we announced that the wife of Santa Claus had just joined activist grannies, which was, of course, great. Uh, and then um, several campaigns. Uh, the one where it says, um, uh, with the forest color is about our forest um, project where we collect money to buy forest to have it protected. There's a foundation via which we can do that. And we already have a little mummo forest somewhere. Uh, I think maybe it's a virtual forest, but anyway. And in the downside, the picture is about um, a thing that we had last spring before the parliamentary elections. We invited representatives of all the political parties and we discussed some things and made them promise something. and. We'll see if they keep the promises then. In this campaign, we wanted to showcase how life was when we were young, younger than we are today. And, and, and for instance, that some things were better and some things were not better than today. And in the middle, it's me in, the, in a boat on the Baltic Sea. And my message was that when I was at that age, the Baltic Sea was, it was clean. You could wash your teeth in Baltic Sea in the evening in our summer house. And now it's something quite different. We take part to um, demonstrations, but that's not really our thing because we are scattered all over the Finland. But anyway, it's one way of acting. We've got some awards, which is, of course, great. And then in addition to this very... Um, very interesting and promising Nordic collaboration. We are collaborating in some uh, other, some global things. This is from an um, e-meeting of Our Kids Climate Organization, which has um, maybe 70 groups all around the world uh, belonging to this uh, umbrella organization. And, and they are, um, for instance, exactly now, um, what I've been doing in, in my hotel all the nights is that I'm reading microgrant applications. We had, uh, we had uh, there's a foundation that gives money that we can circulate um, and, and, and share uh, to p groups, to projects all over the world. But unfortunately, there are so many, there, there were nearly 500 applications, and it's a really hard and heartbreaking experience to read those, most of them from Africa what they plan to do, and what they really do. And now I go to my real topic, which is climate, environment, and health. Well, I think that there are three um, different sort of connections between climate and environment and health. And the first one is that climate change brings along several direct and indirect health threats. And I will, in the next slide, talk about that. But there are the two others, and one is that healthcare is a rather heavy, um, has a rather heavy carbon footprint. Um, in Finland, we have um, calculated that it's approximately 6% of the total carbon footprint in Finland. 
So whenever we go to a doctor, let's remember that this is, uh, this is also part of this um, uh, climate problem. Uh, one thing um, that um, makes uh, this um, is that when we buy a lot of things from abroad to our hospitals here and in Finland, the tubes and the syringes and the masks and everything, so we look more at the price and maybe less at the climate and environmental issues in the local country where these factories are. And then the third thing is that, and it's a funny thing, that whatever personal things I do uh, to to promote, to, to, to prevent climate change, or whatever things are done uh, at the level of the community or the country, they are usually something for health. So if the community decides to have better public traffic, so that's uh, very good for the climate, but that's very good for the health of the citizens. They walk more, and there's less the micro plastic that comes from the tires of the private cars and and if I as a human being decide that I eat less meat then it's very good for my health but it's good for the climate. Similarly parks, if similarly taking down the room temperature which I can mention here I think uh, in Iceland you don't care about saving energy for room temperature but we do in Finland because of the energy crisis and actually, it's very healthy to sleep in 20 degrees instead of 24 degrees. It's, it's been proven. There's one exception, and that's the refrigerators. It's very healthy to keep your food in a refrigerator, but having these machines in all houses is not good for the climate. But then, really, there are several direct and indirect health threats. One is that the tropical diseases are arriving to Nordic countries also with birds and, and mosquitoes and all that. So we will have malaria and dengue fever and many other diseases. I'm, I'm quite sure of that. Not next year, maybe not this year, but after some time if the climate change uh, continues. There's increasing rain that may even be a risk to drinking water. But it's a risk for the houses. We have to have very tight houses in the cold countries, but when it's humid and it's always raining, so the houses start to, I don't know the word, but something green is growing in the, in the buildings and, and we get asthma and, and whatever. And then there will be more storms. We just had horrible st storms and floods in Norway and Sweden, and that will come more common, so they are health threats. Lack of snow is one serious thing. I have heard some people say that, well, it's good to have the climate change because then we will have winters like in Mediterranean. But that's not true because we will not have the light. We will have a very long November in Finland instead of uh, an Italian winter. And it's already causing psychological co consequences, the darkness. Of course, the climate change, the threat itself is psychologically demanding, but, but, but the dark uh, weather is another thing. Then the winters have become more slippery. We are fragile people, we are breaking bones. We have to have spikes all the time in our shoes because the temperature is more or less always around zero in Helsinki, in, in, in half, I would say, Finland. In North Finland, it's still cold and snowy. Well, too hot weather, we heard about it in Elizabeth's presentation. It's a risk. We have the hot weather um, periods are quite short in Nordic countries, but anyway, they are increasing, and that means that we have to have cooling in the houses, which is, uh, of course, bad for, <laughs> it needs energy and it's bad for the climate, but we have to do it because it's becoming too hot. And then there's uh, the indirect risk that heat and rising sea level means that there will be increasing migration to the Nordic countries. Um, I was in, is it per Perlan, or no? the museum in the hill? And, and there I learned yesterday that uh, very little uh, rise in sea level, half uh, 50 centimeters or something, already takes out half of Pakistan. And so the people 
whoever can leave the country and go somewhere, they will do it. And maybe they want to come to the Nordic countries and bring their tuberculosis and HIV and things that we have conquered here, more or less. And so it could be that after some years, boats like this are approaching Reykjavik. And what can we do? In Finland, we have actually started to build a fence. We have a very long border towards Russia, and there may be other reasons to build a fence also, but, but we don't want the same thing to happen that happened in Bel between Belarus and Poland, that, that they sort of send uh, refugees there. And if a boat comes, well, you can shoot a torpedo or something, but then we are no more human beings. So this is a really serious threat as well. And this is my last slide. Uh, there's a saying in Finnish, eteenpäin sanoi mumma lumessa. It means like, let's go forward even if we are stuck in the snow. And, uh, and this is um, something that uh, we are maybe not anymore stuck in the snow because there's less snow. But there are other problems on the way. But I think that the activist grannies and all of us, we, we will go forward anyway. So thank you. Thank you, Helena. And we will take the questions afterwards in the panel, as I said. And now we have only one uh, last presentation left of these three in this session, and it comes from Iceland. And it's made by Birna Sigurjónsdóttir and Thora Ellen Thorarsdóttir. Birna will come here first, and they are representing the University of the Third Age. Háskóli Þriðja Æfiskeisins. Birna, Birna. Hello, Thora, help me out of the My name is uh, Birna Sigurjónsdóttir, and I uh, sit on the board of uh, U3A. Reykjavík University of the Third Age, and I want to give you a, a short introduction into the activities of the U3A of Reykjavík. And then afterwards, I will give the word to Thora Ellen, who will speak on our behalf. Okay. Is this better? You can hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, UCA Reykjavík is part of uh, uh, University of the Third Age uh, internationally. It's an international association with uh, millions of members worldwide. And um, it was founded in, in Iceland in 2012 by a lady uh, who, uh, whose name is Ingibjörg. Uh, and around 30 members joined in the first year, but now we are 1,300, and so the membership has grown steadily uh, through these years. The goal of U3A in Iceland, as elsewhere, is to provide a forum for lifelong learning by sharing knowledge, experience, and stimulating an active life. Um, yeah. The core activity of U3A Reykjavík is uh, weekly lectures on diverse uh, topics, but we also have courses, short courses, uh, we do visits to uh, institutions and, and private companies, excursions and group activities. Just a few examples here of our presentations. These are from the last year. 
So we see here uh, uh, the topics are, are uh, diverse. And um, these are given uh, each week from uh, September to May. Uh, on average, uh, about 40 members uh, come to the lectures. But we uh, also uh, stream them on Zoom and uh, record them and make them available to our members for a week after. So, so there's always ongoing uh, lectures for our members to uh, listen and, and listen to. And in this way, about 200 uh, members enjoy these lectures every week. Mm. We have group activities. There are about uh, five uh, active groups right now. And one of these groups is the uh, group on environment and climate with the uh, goal of raising awareness about the environmental issues. 23 people are listed in the group, but the steering committee has arranged uh, events and lectures open for all UTA members. The main purpose of this group is to uh, give information, okay, yeah. <laughs> give information about what threatens Icelandic nature, life on land, in fresh water and the sea. And, of course, even more importantly, to raise awareness about climate change and and awareness about ways how to protect our nature and climate. Yeah, how for the ghost case. Swana. Yeah, on this note, I, I give the word to Thora Ellen, who is speaking on our behalf on the climate issues. Thank you. Hi, it's nice to be here and thank you, but I'm not actually going to talk about climate issues. <laughs> I was asked to address the demand for land in Iceland and what were the main threats, uh, future threats, um, as I saw them. And um, I think the reason that I was asked by the U3A to address this is because the concerns that I will address um, prompted the establishment of the latest environmental organization in Iceland, Friends of Icelandic Nature. And um, um, the, the people that came together and, and formed this are almost all senior um, citizens. So I'm going to try to go through this um, quite quickly. I will give you some idea of land cover in Iceland and land, agricultural land use, basically to illustrate how different Iceland is from the rest of Europe. And because time is so short, I will then focus on what I believe is the main threat on the horizon to biodiversity in Iceland. And, and that is not, in fact, um, climate change. So just very briefly on uh, um, the um, sort of peculiarities of Iceland, um, only about one quarter of Iceland is, in fact, inhabited. Almost all inhabited areas are below um, 200 meters above sea level. So the inhabited areas are along the coast and in the lowlands of the uh, south and west. Most of the rest is this central highland plateau, most of which has never been uh, inhabited by man. 
And if we look at an image of Iceland at night, you can see just how sparsely... Just how sparsely populated it is. You see, um, you see the city and the urban areas in the southwest. Um, you see the city of or the town of Akureyri in the north. But the uh, oh, you can't really see this very well. But this actually, these lights, these lights up here are not. Um, they are not a town. It's the uh, geothermal glass houses at at um, Flúðir. Um, but I think I need to give you a quick summary of the land cover of Iceland. And to do this, uh, it's easiest to look at the sort of pan-European um, Corinne project that used a common methodology to classify land cover in, in Europe. And uh, it turns out that in this pan-European system, um, almost 88% of the land in Iceland falls under forest and semi-natural areas. Uh, even if our forest cover is less than 2%. Um, and 80% uh, of the land falls into just four categories. Moors and heathlands, 35%. Bare rocks, 23%. Sparsely vegetated land, 13%. And then glaciers, 10.5%. So about half of the land surface is either moors uh, and heathland or sparsely uh, vegetated areas. Uh, another fact um, um, on Iceland is that for the longest period of our settlement history, that's about the past 1,100 years, Iceland remained almost exclusively rural. And even in 1900, 80% of the population lived on farms. Um, so thinking about the future land use, there are, I think, two statistics that we would want to look at. First of all, it's the, it's the number of farms. And I give you two statistics here. It's first what is called, I call it registered farms. It's um, um, farms on land that is extensive enough to um, um, provide a living from agriculture and that is listed in the official register, registry of, um, of farms. Um, the second statistic is farms in production. And uh, this was down to about 2,600 in 2010. It's probably lower still now. So you see that less than half of the registered farms um, are actually in uh, active agricultural um, production. The second statistic that is uh, relevant is the size of the farms in terms of area. And I know that just citing hectares is probably not going to mean very much to most of you. So um, I found the mean sizes of farms in uh, Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden. And this varies, uh, if my statistics are correct, from about um, 20 hectares uh, in Norway, 50 in Sweden and Finland, up to about 70 in Denmark. So how does the average farm in Iceland compare with this? The mean size of the Icelandic farm is just over 1,100 hectares. It's over 20 times roughly the mean um, area in, uh, in Scandinavia. And as the land gets less productive in the sort of colder and less productive regions, the mean size or most of the farms, in fact, not just the mean, the most of the farms are over a thousand hectares. So, to summarize this, in terms of both land cover and land use, Iceland is hugely different from all other European countries. Most of it has never been inhabited. Our agriculture is predominantly animal husbandry. The farms are huge in terms of area. Most of them have, up until now, been family-run. Uh, uh, but this is changing. Um, the, uh, the map of Iceland shows changes in um, population sizes in the, in the um, local communities. 
uh, between 1992 and 2013, and red shows local communities where the population has decreased. And this trend has continued up until this day. Um, so we are seeing uh, radical changes with the next generation with a um, greater number of farms going out of traditional agriculture, which will mean uh, uh, attendant changes in vegetation because the land will no longer be grazed by livestock, or uh, the hay meadows will not be, not be mown. It will also mean changes in the social fabric of these rural areas, and some of these so, uh, local communities are very small. But then the question arises, who buys these farms when they are on the market, and what do these new landowners do with the land? Um, there are two kinds of buyers. It's foreigners and it's Icelanders. And since I have little time, I don't think I have time to go through this carefully <laughs> prepared slide of mine that I had to sort of dig out because you cannot find the, um, any summary of these statistics. So I don't know how many Icelandic urban buyers there are, how many farms they own, or how many foreigners, but I think there is a difference between the Icelandic property buyers, many of which are urban people from Reykjavik, and the foreigners in that I think most of the Icelanders only own one farm, whereas the foreigners um, like to buy lots of farms. And uh, the, uh, the uh, most prolific landowner is a British millionaire. I understand he's one of the richest people in Britain. He owns 41 farms in Iceland, 1.4% um, of the total land area um, of Iceland. So what do these people do with the land, be they Icelanders or foreigners? Um, many of them like to go in for afforestation. And um, I think many of them um, do this because they, uh, um, they think they are, they are doing good. Uh, they are doing both the land and the earth good um, that they are taking part in a commendable environmental initiative. Uh, but taking part in the regional afforestation um, programs um, also carries with it very substantial financial benefits because this is a very heavily subsidized activity in Iceland. However, this has left many biologists, including myself, worried. And this is the reason that this new um, environmental organization, Friends of Icelandic Nature, was um, established. We are first worried by the scale of the um, forestation plans as put forward by the Forest Service. They want at least 12% of Iceland to be um, forested by the end of the century. Now, most of this will be on land that is below 200 meters above sea level, it's about half of the land um, below 200 meters. And um, second, we are worried, uh, by the way, this, uh, these uh, afforestation programs have been organized because they are not, not organized in a few large plantations, but in an island of very small plantations, about 800 of them, in fact. We're also worried by the choice of species because most of this is carried out with um, exotic species, particularly exotic conifers, and the species that is most planted is the lodgepole pine. An American species um, that is now blacklisted in many other countries because it has turned out to be highly invasive. Um, the picture on the and on the, on the, at the top is from Patagonia. Um, it is blacklisted in uh, New Zealand, where you may not um, cultivate it, uh, distribute it, or sell it. And it is listed in Sweden as um, 
a species with high potential invasibility and high ecological impact. Although it is the species that has most been um, promoted um, as a plantation tree in Iceland, um, very little has been published on its actual behavior in Icelandic ecosystems. And there is now coming out um, a paper on um, the uh, uh, spread of the lodgepole pine in southeast Iceland and on the ecological consequences. And um, this um, study shows that um, the species can spread extremely fast it can spread into both open birch woodland, into heathlands, into grass heath, and it carries with it significant reductions in, in species richness and in diversity. So, just to summarize this, um, uh, we are worried. Uh, we believe that um, the Icelandic ecosystems are susceptible. They will not be able to... Um, uh, stop the spread of the lodgepole pine. It naturally forms extremely dense forests. And also, um, in addition to our study in southeast Iceland, there are now published papers on very negative impacts of these um, conifer plantations on birds, and particularly on the bird species that nest in open habitats and are special responsibility species for Iceland, which means that they are species that uh, were a very high proportion of the breeding population, either European or global, um, relies on uh, uh, nesting sites um, in Iceland. And looking to the failure of success in other countries to eradicate the uh, lodgepole pine, um, we believe that this will be also the case in Iceland. And like I showed you before, this, these, are, these plantations are planted into extremely extensive farm properties um, with this next generation of uh, landowners that are probably largely absent. Um, they will not uh, be scouring the land to pick up stray um, pines and uh, the land will not be grazed by livestock, which will also add to the, um, um, to the uh, aid, the establishment of, um, of these pines. But tomorrow, um, Hjalmar Atnason will address you on behalf of this new um, uh, environmental organization, and you can then maybe address questions to him also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Birna and Thora. We are a little behind schedule now, like um, eight minutes. Half of it is my fault. <laughs> Half of it I can blame some other people for, but I won't. It's quite natural. But now we have like, let's say, 10 minutes for a panel discussion. So I would ask the presenters uh, from the first session, that is Eric, uh, Helena, Birna and Thora to come up here. It's just one little table. You can stand around it and hopefully the microphone will, will hear your voices. And now uh, you can post questions to them. Uh, I will do my best to uh, sort of bring those questions forward. Uh, so maybe you can just gather around this only microphone. It's, it's so hopefully you will be heard in the in the yeah for the streaming session. So I'm checking out Slido. We're using Slido, but you are, you also should feel free to come up with questions. We don't have a microphone uh, traveling around, so if you have questions, just raise your hand, and I'll try to repeat your questions. But uh, let's start with one of the questions in Slido. And the question is about what would, should be the first steps or what are the first steps uh, when starting an organization of older people in a country where no such organization exists. I guess the, the, uh, the Swedish and Finnish representatives will be more able to answer these questions than we Icelanders. 
So what would you say? What would be the first steps if you want to create an organization of, of seniors interested in climate issues in a country where no such organization exists? If, if you would start, Helena. Does it work? Does it work? Yeah, okay. it works. Well, you have to have a group of enthusiastic people. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. And I don't know how big the group should be. We were 12 when we started, but uh, I think that one or two is maybe hardly enough. So that's the first step. And then you have to have a plan that what do you focus on? What are your principles? What is your goal? And, and for us, it took something like half-year discussions before we start, opened and started our website and so on, because we wanted to really know what we want. So it's like big work. What you say? Uh, uh, and I, I can just uh, agree. There need to be some, one or some persons with a keen interest in, in, in the question, and then they talk with their friends and neighbors and so on, and <clears> then <throat> there's some, some kind of criti critical mass, as it said. When there are cells, maybe t t 10 persons or more, one can go out to, to the square or, or where, where we're like, like that together, and then people will pass and join. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess this leads us to another question. Maybe, will, would you like to add something, Birna or Thora? Yeah. I just uh, agree with uh, what has been said. You have to have enthusiastic, enthusiastic people to start. And, and just in, in uh, I think, in a logical, uh, with a logical link to this question, there's another question. Uh, do you think that older people with some climate background, some, some sort of background in climate issues, would be more likely to engage or volunteer in this uh, type of activities than other people with no such background. What would you think if, if you start, Thora? Um, yes, I, uh, I think so. I think it always helps um, to have people with, um, with a firm grasp of the facts and the major issues and um, a long history of, um, of following the discussion just in the media and, and, uh, and wherever. So yes, I, I, think the, I think your work becomes more focused, more effective, and uh, I can at least say that uh, for this um, uh, Friends of Icelandic Nature um, group in, in, in Iceland, um, it's all old people or mostly old people, mostly retired people, but it's people with a um, great deal of experience, a great deal of know-how of how governance works, <laughs> lots of contacts, and this all helps. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, I, I fully agree. But then I think that the great thing is the diversity of the group. That We, for instance, have a, have a child psychiatrist in the group, and, and, and we have an artist and who makes everything, the pictures, and so on. So it's, it's, you have to have the facts there, and, and then in addition you have to have diverse people around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the enthusiasm. And, and Eric. <clears throat> and I also agree, but um, in my group, uh, all of us are not um, natural scientists or so, uh, with no, that knowledge, but they are cu curious, and so that, that's why we have, have had study groups to spread the knowledge. Mm -hmm. So st study groups, I think, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So it sounds uh, you'd like to add something? Yes, uh, I would like to mention the uh, uh, importance of cooperation between generations. Uh, in, in U3A, our group, we are uh, uh, communicating with the young uh, environment activists. So that's when things start to happen, when we work across generations. Mm. So may maybe it can be summarized in a way that it's great to have some uh, senior scientists like Thor Allen, 
I shouldn't call you senior yet, but <laughs> soon. Uh, that is because she has a background in, in nature science and so have many of her colleagues in, in this new organization. But yeah, as I say, we, we should have a sort of a mixture of that kind of people that really have this uh, uh, scientific, scientific background and, and enthusiasms, uh, enthusiasts that have contacts, that have grandchildren, and then also, as, as Birna mentioned, to connect this to other generations so you're not as isolated. It's just my way of summarizing, but Bengt, I think... Just a, just a question. Uh, in Sweden, I think many, at least politicians, but also other person, think that activists uh, in the environment, about environmental issues are always left-wing uh, people. Uh, so partly our uh, activity are seen as left-wing propaganda, for example, uh, which is uh, uh, an obstacle, mm -hmm. I think. Have you any comments to that, especially in, in the other Nordic countries? I, maybe I should, I should repeat the question shortly to be sure it is heard by the people out there. The question was basically, he said, uh, Bengt said that in Sweden, uh, uh, environmental activists or climate activists are sort of stamped as left-wing people and if that's also your experience, that you are on forehand stamped as left-wing, so mm -hmm. you are classified uh, on forehand as a part of a political movement. Well, if I say about activist is we try to announce that we are very, very non-political. But our age group in Finland is the age group that is most active in any elections. So every party is, in a way, interested in our age group. And, and suddenly, I think that, that also the right-wing parties at least claim that they are very green. And so it's, it's hard to say it's, it's no more so clearly left-wing in Finland. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, something to add? Uh, I'd just say that uh, U3A is a non-political uh, organization, and, and we, uh, I don't think even right uh, I mean people can deny the climate change anymore. Mm -hmm. okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they shouldn't. I, there are more questions in Slido uh, and more questions out there. There's one new question here in Slido. I guess it's pretty much uh, uh, directed to Fora. It says, regarding the many new land and farm owners, is the government about to restrict who can buy land and farms and put up restrictions on the use of land? Uh, yes, I think there was a motion in Parliament last year on this, but as I, and I did try to look this up before I gave this talk today. I could not see that it had been, um, you know, that anything had been decided in Parliament on it. Mm -hmm. But certainly it has, um, it, it, it has been a topic of discussion in Iceland. Yeah. Uh, there were some more questions out there. Yeah. Just to continue, is any of those uh, deforestation programs a part of, 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 of the carbon compensation? Uh, yes, they, there are some, but the ones that I was referring to mainly, um, uh, these are, uh, are, are um, sort of state-supported uh, programs, but there are also private companies where you can, where you can buy... <laughs> um, afforestation uh, and uh, again that is mostly done with um, ex or only done I think with exotic species mm. yeah, the question but was, that is in yeah. addition to what I was talking about mm. the question was I don't know if you heard it out there but the question was about if, if these uh, uh, afforestation activities are, are partly producing some kind of carbon units or something like that but if I can add to that it, it feels like there is a sort of a Klondike going on, that everyone wants to make money in the near future by selling carbon credits. Uh, the, the, the rules are not quite established, but people are sort of betting on it, that this will be a great market, and it might have some impact on, 
on the interest of uh, investors to invest in farms. And actually, and now I'm, I'm stepping out of my box, sort of. But I, I think uh, we might see some interesting, uh, uh, interesting, you know, events where uh, sort of bad properties are sold at higher prices because they have opportunities that the sort of good properties don't have. So it might have some kind of reverse effect in, in how prices are decided, but this is just my opinion. Um, okay, we should, uh, yeah, there is one more question and then I'll, I'll uh, have to close this. Uh, the question is, can the groups agree on well-defined climate policy action or only one general call for action? This is like, is it a one action that you would sort of, this is the most important. Can you define, uh, yeah, a well-defined, uh, 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 can, can you agree on a well-defined climate action? What, what is a really a good climate action? Uh, and I would say that um, uh, we are the, the different Greta's uh, oldest groups. They agree on the goal but um, not on, on the actions. Yeah. Uh, the, the groups work in, in independently of each other. And um, personally, I think they are the most, we, ha we have the um, uh, most um, p p possibilities to su su success on the local level. And the questions may vary from one borough to another. But th that's my opinion. Yeah. Uh, then, then there is a very last question, and I, then I have to close this discussion because you have short, short time. And it, because, you know, we, we are, or you are, okay, I have to include myself, like we are elderly people, we are, we are seniors. Uh, so the target of, of your work, most of your work, I think, is pretty much on seniors, or isn't it? Uh, does it have advantages or disadvantages to focus on a certain age group uh, in your work? Uh, Birna, uh, replied to this in a way, uh, talking about this importance of cooperation between generations, but can you mention any, any advantages or disadvantages uh, in this focus on, on elderly people? Mm, I think uh, there's some advantage uh, to address to the uh, year group uh, U3A relates to uh, people over 50, but uh, actually 65 to 75 are most of our members. Um, it is an advantage because we can, uh, we have common experience, we have common knowledge that we can relate to and, and uh, yeah, talk about. Mm. Right, uh, we have to close now. Helena, maybe you will have the last word. How about that? <laughs> Uh, because you come from furthest away. <laughs> we have time. We have, most of us, we have time. And, and that's, that's a resource that is missing in the younger generations very much. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Yeah, this, this is a good, good last word. You have time that others don't have. And you have the knowledge and experience. Thank you very much. Now we take like 20 minutes, am I right? 20 minutes coffee break. And we are exactly 40 minutes behind schedule. It's not really dangerous. We will 14, 10, 10 minutes, no, 20 minutes coffee break. And yeah, yeah, there is one, one thing that I want to do during the coffee break because I think we are, we are here at an historic event. And I would like a group photo of, of all of us uh, before the coffee, breaks, coffee break ends. So let's take the last couple of minutes of the coffee break to yeah, make a great photo for the media. And we'll be back. Um, the time is now uh, 13, let's say 30 minutes. Let's, let's gather for a photo in 15 minutes, like in yeah, half past the latest. Okay, find some coffee.
Well, well, guys, how about taking this group photo now? So maybe you just should leave your coffee in your cups. Hopefully it stay warm. We'll only, it will only take a minute or two. So maybe you should go outside, just, out, just outside the door to have a good light. And let's all gather outside for a group photo. Ingibjörg, we're going to go to the window here. Everyone out there. It's the best to get out there. You're not with me. I'm not with you. Let's get outside group photo. Well, folks, let's 
let's carry on to the last session of the day. Or well, let's maybe the second last session we have we will have three more presentations, then we have then we will have a short panel discussion like before, and then we will end the day with group work to sort of summarize the most important findings of the day. So I hope you are all here again, and we will now uh, start, and I, I should say we are 16 minutes, 16 minutes behind schedule, it's not fatal. Uh, we will start with Landsamband Pensionista, it's the uh, organization of older people in Faroe Islands. It's Beata Samuelsen who will talk about relevant older people's activities in the Faroe Islands. And I need to find the slides. Hmm. It's okay. I have no slides. You have no slides. No. Then I don't bother. Yeah. Hmm. Just have this. Huh? Okay. Thank you. I come from Faroe Islands, and I am the chairman of Landsvela Pensionista. My name is Beata Lindensko Samuelsen. And I will talk about relevant older people's activities in the Faroe Islands. This is the title of the topic that Landsfella Pensionista received from the Nordic Council of Ministers a few months ago. And it was in connection with the seminar that Reykjavik is hosting today and tomorrow. The project is incredibly large and comprehensive and includes many topics that in, are invitably linked to the project's common description, older people and climate, benefits for both. Actually, we at Landsvela Pensionista in the Faroe Islands are not concerned with the environment, energy or climate, as our association is an umbrella organization with 16 pensioner and elderly associations, associations as members. Landsvela Pensionista, which is non-political, looks after the common interests of all elderly people with regard to pensions. We also act as advisors and liaisons between pensioners and the Faroese political uh, system, the Faroese government, which is our government, and the Lakting, which has the same status as the Danish parliament, the uh, Icelandic Althing, etc. But suddenly, many other things have appeared in our little Faroese paradise. We live in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, all by ourselves. And as a relatively small dot, we have also become very important in terms of the environment and climate. If we look back about 50 years ago, everything was different. Back then, we threw all rubbish directly into the sea without thinking about the damage that all the rubbish from our small islands was causing to our little planet, the Earth. Old cars, kitchen waste, car tires, bicycles, plastic, broken electrical items, everything was thrown into the sea. We didn't give much thought to where it all went. Well, maybe the thought crossed our minds from time to time. The fact that it was destroying the environment didn't cross our minds. We didn't see it. The rubbish was invisible. It was in the sea and is undoubtedly still there today. But when you see images from India and Pakistan, for example, where rubbish is just floating in the streets or piled up a short distance outside the big cities with millions of inhabitants, 
it, make, it makes feel you sick. And when documentaries from the Philippines show poor people, poor children walking barefoot on steaming or rubbish, hot rubbish dumps looking for something edible, well, you turn a blind eye, blind eye and feel disgust. The question arises, do the authorities in the respective countries, which are so far away from us, not even think about the environment? Maybe no, maybe yes, but what should they do? And what about ourselves? How do we behave? We think we live a perfect life, but dump all our rubbish in, in the sea. Or do we blow part of it off by setting the whole thing on fire, just destroying the atmosphere? Our conscience in this regard is nothing to brag about. The four seasons came and went as they were supposed to according to the calendar when we, now older, were teenagers. Everything was at least used to be, every day, but not anymore. Everything has changed and today, hopefully we have become a lot wiser, including us in the Faroe Islands. Fortunately, we have realized that we as humans can change things. The question is, is it not too late? But as the saying goes, better than late than never. As an umbrella organization, Landsfella Pensionista cannot do very much. But what we can do as an organization for the elderly is soak up all the information we get at a seminar like this one in Reykjavik these days. And we can and will pass on this knowledge to our local members, who can then each in their own way encourage us to, to do our part, to think environmentally friendly every single day. As mentioned above, the environment and climate are not included in the statutes that the work of Landsfella Pensionista has in its agenda. But this can be changed. We are very aware of how important it is to address the issue and do something about it in order to turn centuries of environmental vandalism in the right direction. It's last minute, I would say. Perhaps it's already too late, given the climate change of the last few years, especially this summer, when one climate catastrophe after another has taken over our planet. Everything has been turned upside down. The weather seems to live its own life without regard for anything, thanks to us humans. It's our fault. We in the Faroe Islands are aware of how serious the environmental situation is, and we have several examples of this. As a Faroese, we don't shout about it out loud, especially not when you're older. You experiment in your own garden, you don't throw everything away unnecessarily, you think about it. The interest is recycling has grown, and it's dropping off in our small community, thankfully. And the jungle drums are going. People are showing interest in their neighbors and are happy about the things that succeed in terms of climate and the environment. Just to give you an, an example, some neighbor, neighborhood, neighborhoods have set up small community, community events with vegetable gardens and potato rows to reduce the air and the sea transport of these and other goods from about, 
abroad. In our youth, many households had a very, very small vegetable garden that grew the most delicious rhubarb. They were tended and nurtured with the utmost care, providing the family's vitamin requirements throughout the summer when rhubarb was a part of Sunday meals. As a youngster, I was surprised that people abroad were not interested in this plant. I was told that it was a weed and that it should be er eradicated. Today, it's almost a regular part of desserts in the finest restaurants on the islands. In describing this small example, I just want to mention that a weed like rhubarb also has an impact in our climate and environment. For many years, the plant has been underestimated, but in reality, it has a tiny, tiny impact on the world's climate. Without having exact proof, we know that many elderly people in our small Faroese community are making a big effort, effort to turn the climate and environment in the right direction. But my mate from Faroe Islands, Olau Paulsen, he is sitting over there beside me, can tell us much, about, much more about this in his lecture tomorrow. It is not so that nothing is happening in relation to climate in the Faroe Islands, because in next week, next Monday, then next Tuesday, the 3rd of October, we are going to a conference in the Nordic House in Toshan about nature and diversity that the Faroese Nature and Environment Association organizes. It's on, now on Tuesday. As I mentioned in a short sentence at the beginning of this post, we at Landsfella Pensionista will spread all the knowledge we gain here in Reykjavik at this seminar to our 16 organizations, which together have around 1,700 members across the country of Faroe Islands. Thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little about older people's activities in the Faroe Islands. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Beata. Uh, next, we will have a member from Norway, Andrew Kroglund. And he is going to tell us a little bit about the European network, the organizations, uh, yeah, both about best of all this clima action in, in Norway and, and, and their part in creating an European network of these organizations. So. Ska bara finna det här. Yes. Is it the right presentation? That's the right one. Yes. No. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Andrew. That's not a very Norwegian name, now, is it? And that's uh, the reason for that is that my father, in true Viking style, went over to England and grabbed hold of a young lassie's, not hair, but hand, and lured her back into Norway. Um, how does the Norwegian Grandparents Climate Campaign work nationally and interact internationally? Well, let's delve into uh, that, but let's just start with the fact that we live in extremely interesting times, in the sense that we are the first people on Earth who are aware of the fact that we are moving from one geological period to another. We are moving from what is called the Holocene to the Anthropocene. Anthropocene meaning man-made age. 
and we are becoming aware of the fact that what we do as individuals sums up to what we do as nations and sums up again to what we do globally and we have an ecological footprint which again uh, makes the words uh, or the world's geophysical limits come onto the horizon. We have gone beyond the limits of what the planet can produce. And in Norway, for instance, the World Overshoot Day is already uh, appearing on the horizon around the 23rd of April. The Norwegians have used more of the biophysical capacity of the globe, of the planet, by the first quarter. And that is, of course, a challenge for us all. And of course, I mean, if you grow up today, you might, or tomorrow, our grandchildren might see polar bears, which um, they, they live on the Svalbard archipelago, the Spitsbergen area up north, which is under Norwegian jurisdiction. They might see them only in museums like this, because the climate is changing so rapidly the farther north you go. And just to give you an idea of the challenges we face, have a look at Norway. Norway is a fairly large country, few people, we are approximately five and a half million people. At around 1900, all those dark green areas are labeled as wilderness. Now, wilderness is defined as an area more than five kilometers away from human intervention by uh, roads or cabins or power masts. At the uh, year when the Second World War came to Norway, 1940, there was still quite a lot of wilderness left. But today, this is from 2018, there's hardly any wilderness left. Of course, if you travel to Norway, you'll see amazing greenery, fantastic mountains and fjords, a lot of forests. But biodiverse, biodiversity is, is, you know, it's not there, not in the same sense as it used to be 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago. We are rapidly losing nature's capacity to produce. And it's happening just in front of us. And for the world's rainforests, the situation is even worse. That is what it used to be like. That's what it's like today. Look at the difference. Look at the difference. And you know, this is important to people living in Iceland. What is happening in the Amazon will have repercussions for the Gulf Stream. All these ocean conveyor belts are influenced by rain patterns, cloud patterns, wind patterns, and all this is again influenced by the amount of forest cover in the Amazon, in the Congo Basin, in Indonesia. At the same time, what is happening here in Iceland is also important to people abroad, like we just heard in this terrifying, if, if you like, um, story about what is happening to the uh, ground cover here in Iceland, foreigners buying up country, planting it with, you know, bad species. That will also have a repercussion later on for all people. So these are some of the backgrounds for, obviously, uh, the, the interest in environment in, 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 the, in the broad sense of, of what the environment is. So in 2006, there was a librarian who promoted the idea that elderly people in Norway should be more vociferous when it comes to climate issues. He and others um, got a couple of uh, former prime ministers, uh, the, the chancellor of the Cheka, a former uh, chancellor, uh, to sign a petition and they went public and said that we grandparents, we care about what's happening and we want to leave uh, the planet in a better uh, state when we leave it to our grandchildren. So we have to act now. Uh, we became independent in 2012. It's approximately, we have approximately, you know, just below 7,000 members. And when in all, when you get 5,000 members in a, an environmental organization, the state will come in and, and, and give you money 
because the state says it is good to have a vibrant civil society. We want to give you money in order to continue to bite the hand that feeds you because that's what we do. We criticize the government all the time. So we bite the hand that feeds us. They feed us with a lot of money. So we have a responsibility to tell society what is happening in order to influence politicians to make it easier for them to make probably unpopular uh, decisions. And we have 17 local branches all around the country and we have as a stated purpose, this is the, by the way the, um, the chairman of the organization, she's called Linda with her grand uh, child and obviously in all our information material we try to have this type of image of the elderly person together with a grandchildren because a grandchild because that you know awakens something in your heart it's something that most people can associate with as a parent or as a grandparent and of course our main purpose then is a comprehensive cut in greenhouse gas emissions um, and in order to do so, I mean, obviously, Norway, Norway has become very rich because we have oil and gas resources. We have had a good management of these resources. We have stuck the money away, if you like, in a pension fund, which is probably the world's largest of its kind. So it's been, it's been um, handed in a very grown-up manner, in a very proper manner, and we should be thankful to the politicians that had this um, idea of doing it this way. But at the same time, Norway is also one of the staunchest deniers, if you like, of the current position that we all face. And Norway is still investing heavily in, in oil drilling in the north, in the Barents Sea, etc. And the Grandparents um, Climate Campaign in Norway therefore uses what is called the Article 112 of the Norwegian Constitution for all its worth, because that states that we should leave uh, our environment in a, a better position than what we got it when we were born, and that um, natural resources shall be used on the basis of a long-term and a comprehensive consideration that safeguards this right also for posterity. So we took the state to the courts in order to fight them when they um, gave um, licenses to, to drill in the Arctic, uh, but we lost. Uh, but there are new cases coming up and the state is becoming more and more defensive, I'd say, because they realize that there is a sort of a change in the tide uh, internationally. So we are very visible in the media. Uh, we like good promotions. Uh, we have clear political objectives. We are members of various national networks. So we work together with other organizations because if you, if you work together with others, you become much stronger. Um, we send letters to ministers. We, we meet in parliament and, and we you know, talk to politicians. And we are also very in, uh, into being solidaric with the global south. It's very important that rich countries pay the global south to compensate for all we have inflicted upon them, if you like, by having um, used too much of the CO2 uh, um, possibilities that they don't have any longer because we have misused it. And this is how we are, you know, when we are out on the streets, just like Benta has had her red hat on. This is sort of a uniform we have. Some people like it, some people don't. But it's a sort of a mark of identity. Uh, and we use a lot of culture, song, music, portraying a sort of a positive outlook, not a gloom and doom, but a positive outlook. These are elderly people who aren't sort of uh, too preoccupied um, as to how they appear. They are themselves, and this gives credence, if you like. And this is uh, our uh, leader of the board, and uh, together with another member, meeting up in parliament, talking to politicians. 
you write reports. This is a report we wrote a couple of years ago, uh, talking about how a black uh, type of industry uh, is being greenwashed, uh, Equinor, etc. We propose that um, you have on the gasoline pumps this kills, just like on the tobacco, you know, uh, packs. Uh, stuff like that. It, it won't happen necessarily, but, you know, we promote that type of discussion. Um, we give talks at, at, at demonstrations and stuff. This is a picture I took a couple of years ago. It says Jonas, who is Jonas Garstöder, who is the Premier Minister, Prime Minister. Remember what you promised your grandchildren, these two young men say, because he promised when he... Uh, became um, head of the government, prime minister, that I'll do everything in my power to do something about the climate crisis. He hasn't. So we have to keep, you know, hold him to account. And interestingly speaking, you know, uh, on, uh, in 2022, in July, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution that recognizes the right to a healthy and sustainable environment as a universal human right. You know, we had our colleague from, from Switzerland uh, this morning. This is in the same type of line. So things are happening. Things are happening. And that is very important because the loser, the loser of what is now happening is this young girl. Girls and women are the main losers of what ha is happening when you have climate change. She, at this little farm she, uh, she and her ha family runs in, in, in Africa, will run out of water and she will be taken out of school because she is the one who has to go to the next pumping station to get water. And then she will be pregnant much earlier and you'll have this demographic problem. You'll have a lot of more children in countries which are basically poor. So that is a one of the lessons. Uh, this is just to show you how we work. This is the Norwegian delegation at the COP28 in Glasgow where I went. That's the reason why we have all these facial masks because that was uh, a couple of years ago. And we interact with the government officials every day and tell them our you know, take on today's del deliberations. That's part of the system. At the same time, we go onto the streets and demonstrate together with the people. So there are two fronts, two fronts. Very important. And we're not afraid of criticizing the Norwegian government. As I said, we bite the hand that feeds us. So we are very critical to Norwegian oil policy. Um, and just recently, the last year, one and a half years, there has come onto the scene a European network of grandparents' um, organizations. And we are part and parcel of that. We have given them some money in order that um, we can have a um, web page. So if you Google European Grandparents Campaign Climate, you'll c come to the uh, home page. Maybe next year, depends a little bit on what happens here also. Maybe next year, September or something, we'll have a major European convention get together in Oslo. So we might see a lot of you there. Let's have a look. Let's see what the... Uh, the Nordic Council says maybe they will support us with a little money, who knows? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, you know, just in simple terms, this is what we want to keep the, the lovely blue marble, the only place in the universe where we know there is organic life and not hothouse earth. And in, in case there are any climate skeptics amongst you, here is the evidence, obviously. This always takes today, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. And in the future, if we get less trees, this will be a problem. <laughs> and so, you know, take our children or grandchildren. This is my daughter to the far right. If we take them into nature from an early age, they will become part of this struggle because nature love is what it's all about. And giving them a horizon to look out on. This is uh, my bonus grandchild. She came to this mountain top when she was four years old and she came to the top and she said, ah, now I can see the whole world. And this is, you know, the wonder which we have to keep. We want to see the whole world. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Andrew. As, as someone said, we have to save the Earth. It's the only planet with chocolate. You will, you will not find chocolate any else, in, in any other place. And now it's time to introduce Kira Geling uh, Hansen. And she is uh, a manager of a very interesting project in Denmark. And she will tell us about this project. It is uh, how about it's 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 about how libraries uh, can be platforms for citizen involvement and sustainability. And yeah, that's a good. Thank you so much for having this summit, and thank you for inviting me. I'm Kira Gilling Hansen, and um, I think I have to take the microphone a bit down. Is it better now? Yeah? Well, <laughs> I think that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. I work for a think tank in Denmark that's called Future Libraries, and we also work with libraries throughout the country. And I've been invited here today because I've been working with seniors on collaborating different activities throughout the country. But before I get into the work and what we have done in Denmark, I would like to thank you, Environice, and also the government of Iceland, and for taking this topic so seriously. Also, I was very impressed today by seeing the Icelandic president. That was really great to see that, and that, makes, that gives me hope, hope for a future. And I hope that many other countries will also invite their presidents when it comes to climate issues. Um, now, the Think Tank Future Libraries and the Danish Association Library Association that I work for, um, has worked on a project for more than two years where we have reached out to senior citizens especially. Of course, more people are invited and many more people can join, but our primarily focus is senior citizens. It was initiated in 2021 and we have been focusing more broadly not just on climate activities but also on the SDGs, social and, and development goals. Um, and today I'm going to speak about that and I'm going to tell you what we have done and what we have achieved in Denmark. First of all, we offer training to library staff. We train them in order to empower them so that they get the necessary skills to lead the SDG focus groups. And this is what I call the groups that are uh, working at the libraries and also with the libraries. They're all volunteers. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we pay special attention to senior citizens. And um, also, we have seen that it's very motivational for all the people joining when we, meet, when we make those generational meetings, when seniors and young people, they meet up. And also, they have made a lot of activities that also involves families and children. So the project is definitely not just for seniors. It's for many other people as well. One of the first and most important things that we have achieved so far is co-creation. Several of you talked about that, both the generational meetings and also co-creation, because this is what we have achieved uh, at the libraries throughout the country. Sustainable societies require those co-creation and also a lot of communities that are engaged in these matters. And this is what we have tried to do the last couple of years. And in order to get more citizens involved in this green transition, we have encouraged them to participate in smaller groups at the library. We start at the library. It might take place other places. It might take place in the nature. It might take place in local groups, also at the Besterfelder. Uh, and this is something I'm going to talk to you about a little bit later. But this is uh, what we do, and we try and support the groups. We try to support them both with money and also with tools, and also we support their ideas. So it has to be the citizens' ideas, and then we support their ideas, and also in order to get uh, ownership of their ideas. We have worked very intensely about how to translate sustainable goals and climate issues into a library context. 
because a lot of our activities actually they are outside, they are in the nature, they are going on many places. But one of the first things that we have recognized and what we have been very much aware of are that climate, the word climate and the word SDG it has to be more practical. We cannot just invite people into the library and expect a lot of people to come when we say, come and hear this, uh, we have a subject about climate. Many times this is too distant, this is too theoretical, and as you probably know as well, it, it might be uh, too difficult for just normal people to grasp. So we have worked very intensively on doing something very practical, like, and, and some of these examples I will come up to, uh, what we have been doing in order to make this in eye level. For example, one of the major things that the project has supported us is repair cafes. We have done upcycling cafes and a lot of sewing workshops and really the sewing machines are running smoothly at libraries all over Denmark at the moment. This is something very practical and this is something most people can relate to, that they can go and they can have fix their electronics or consumer goods or something. And this is something that we have experienced is very good if, I mean, most of you who are here today, you have realized the importance of the climate issues and the global warming. But in order to have more just normal, regular people uh, engage in this work, we have tried to do other things. So what you see here is one of the repair cafes at the left. You have some men, especially men, there are the fixers and the women. They are on the sewing machines fixing and repairing clothes. And also we have Gunnar. Gunnar on the right side, he's having climate-friendly cooking classes every week, primarily for men actually. So the men are really active in Denmark as well. And this is something that gives me hope when I see all these wonderful people throughout Denmark working like that. To scale the effort and to inspire even more people in libraries, we have trained a so-called traveling team that acts as ambassadors for the SDGs and ambassadors for climate. And they are visiting libraries throughout Denmark. For example, we held an SDG boot camp at the United Nations city in Copenhagen where participants learn to share their sustainable journeys and craft stories. And we have done that several times now. The reason why we have this traveling team is that this is a way of motivating other people. Many people are unaware how they can change, how they can bring about change. And we think there is a need for these inspiring stories and motivate people to take action. I think when they see Gunnar or if they see Lars or they see Bende or some of the other wonderful people from the traveling team, they look at them and they hear the stories and they are inspired and they think, oh, it doesn't sound that difficult, then I think I can do that as well. So this is why we, we do it and also all the time we have this thing about it has to be meaningful, it has to feel meaningful, it has to, I mean, you have to use your competences and also feel like you're doing a difference. This is very important. And this is some of the women at the traveling team. We have 30 people in the traveling team at the moment and they are very active. Another very important thing in the project is our attention to nature connectedness. I think most of you who are here, you have mentioned nature many times. Uh, so this is something that we have worked on also with a psychologist, uh, a psychologist that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But it has proven that it does something to our well-being as well. And this is something in this project that we have been paying very much attention to, how we can bring in nature in the library, how we can make activities in nature with the citizens and what does that do to us. So this is something that we have been working on very uh, much the last couple of two years. Also because research shows that a sense of nature connectedness is linked to higher personal well-being and a greater degree of environmentally sustainable behavior. And I guess most of you who are here today, you can recognize that and you can nod on that. <laughs> yeah, because people with higher uh, nature connectedness also have this greater concern for environmental issues and you're also more likely to engage in pro-environmental behaviors 
this is what I have experienced by being here today as well. So it has been a little bit difficult in the beginning, but now we are we are getting uh, a lot of experiences, and we are both working in areas where you have these. Uh, houses. I mean, this was something that was uh, going on before the project started. They have taken over a lot of asphalt, <laughs> making a lot of greenery. They're inviting a lot of people down there, and, and they, are, they are just wonderful ambassadors of how to grow, uh, grow vegetables and, and make little gardens uh, in areas like that. And also, we have been grafting trees, fruit trees. We have been... Um, organizing biodiversity tours, biodiversity tours, and we have done readings in the nature. We have been focusing on literature related to the sounding environment. We have been doing a lot of things. Also, we are trying to plant trees. We're doing that in collaboration with other green organizations. We are very much inspired by a green uh, actor called Green Neighborhood Communities. They are planting trees many places. And, uh, of course, we've been visiting schools because we want to do this more, because we also want to uh, inspire the youth. And one of the participants that I went to this uh, planting tree activity with said, oh, it's also nice for a child to be part of planting trees so that they can stop and say, hey, I helped plant those trees. And I think we all uh, agree on that, that it's important that we inspire the, the youth, the children, and make them aware, not just of the climate issues, because they can be very afraid and they can get it. They have this, some, type, some call it climate anxiety. So this is a very nice and positive way of getting, giving them inspiration, but also giving them hope. So this is something that we focus on a lot. I know we have, we're over time, so I'm not going to go through this list, but you have the slides later, for sure. So these are some of the activities that we have been working on in libraries in Denmark. Uh, I want to pay special attention also to the climate-friendly communal dining. This is something that's very popular, and many people, they come to those communal dinings, and then we serve green tapas, or some kind of creative climate-friendly food, and this is something to engage people that are not already engaged. So this is a very good first step movement. Also, we invite people to workshops and we invite them to all kinds of activities, different presentations, guided walks, and so on. But, but this, I can really recommend you doing those communal dining and you might have done that as well already. Now, what we have achieved so far we have had an external evaluator following the project through, yeah, from start till, till the end. Now we are by the end of the project now. And this uh, impact evaluation says that the project has done something good. <laughs> we have 36 libraries that has joined the project and that was the goal and this is what we, we promised the, the fund that we got money from. Two to three employees from each library are trained and involved in different community creating activities. And all the, the libraries, actually libraries throughout Denmark, that's almost 500 libraries. They are working with the SGDs at the moment. So they are very much involved in, in climate and SGD issues. So that's very positive. It wasn't the issue two years ago, but we are several projects now working in the library uh, association and working together, and we are working together with green organizations. So I think this is why it's really rolling and it's really interesting to follow. Also, we have, of course, brought a lot of people together. We have several hundred people being very active in the groups, but we have talked to and met thousands of people during the last two years because we have had so many activities going on on the different uh, libraries. So, I was talking about the sustainability psychology and well-being earlier, and I want to get a little bit more into that because I think that's very interesting. Because when working with people and when we want to have more people join this agenda, it's very important that we also think about the brain and our minds and how we can talk to people, how we can engage people more. So for the last two years, we have had this 
Simon, <laughs> psychologist and PhD all along, and he has been training staff and also he has been meeting with uh, all the groups. And he has been talking about how we can make a change together, going together and, and do this in a corporate way, as many of you already mentioned. And this is the logic behind the theory, because he's talking about we are not just seeing uh, well-being, we are seeing regenerative well-being. This is the logic behind the theory. When we are not just doing something good for a neighbor, but are engaging in activities that helps the climate and planet, there is a good chance that we feel better. And I think many of you here today, you can nod on that and you know that already. So it's not new to you. But this is something that's very, I mean, good to know when we want to engage more people in this area. So Simon believes, and also the impact evaluator says, for sure, that this is what is going on in these groups. We are facing regenerative well-being, and this is really important to note, to note on that, because this is what we can also enhance, and this is what we can also do more of, and this is what motivates people, because we are contributing, contributing to more than just a neighbor. We are doing something to the planet, so that gives us the feeling of well-being. So, we are doing all kinds of things. We are doing little projects, little garden projects. We are doing so many things, and everybody is saying that has met both participants and also the evaluator that is external says this is what is going on. Um, I promised that I would point out three strategies to boost well-being and motivation, and also highlight the three most important pieces of advice from the project. And I call it strategies to boost well-being and motivation because this is what we have been trying to do the last couple of years. So the first advice for you is that we can encourage motivation and well-being by focusing on people's basic psychological needs. Also, it's a very good idea to offer practical ways for participants to actively support sustainability. So instead of inviting into a climate meeting, we could call it something else, something more practical that they can relate to. And then, of course, your job is to find out what can they relate to, what are they interested in, what are they motivated of. And then finally, we have experienced that it's a good idea to incorporate nature into activities to strengthen participants' bond with nature, as I talked about when I talked about nature connectedness. So, if you're interested, I've put out some books, some little books. It's all in Danish, unfortunately. <laughs> but I have it electronically as well. And um, you can have, if you want... If you want to hear about uh, this project and you want to have more experiences, also what all the participants say, we have books and we have also a podcast called We Do It Together. Many of you here, you speak Danish or you understand Danish, so you might be interested in that. But other than that, I can uh, forward something on and I might be able to do this presentation as well in, uh, in English or it's very easy to translate. But before I conclude my speech... I'll highlight my favorite people and the future heroes. You're all gathered here today, you and all your fellows in, in your respectively countries. At the Climate Folk Meeting in Denmark last year and this year, August, I met the most wonderful climate activists from all over Denmark. 34,000 people, they were united to debate and act on climate issues. And it is growing in numbers each year. And that gives me hope. Impressive speeches and strategies that are not followed up by action cannot prevent the global warming or natural disasters that we are facing. And that is why thousands of grandparents and other climate activists work tirelessly and with great enthusiasm on this agenda. The climate crisis is not a new phenomenon, even though it may seem like that when we are looking at the political results. Most of you here today you have been working on this agenda for many more years than I have. I guess many of you have been working on this agenda since the 70s. You have made impressive actions and demonstrations because you were aware of global warming and the seriousness of the situation many years ago. Thank you for that. Fortunately, you haven't given up. And I think if there are any Swedes here, you might recognize this, because I went on a small island this summer. 
I, I quit flying as well some years ago. So I'm trying to investigate Sweden and Denmark and, and just visiting neighboring countries much more now. And I was so happy to see these. I didn't see any of Greta's coming up, but I saw proof. I found proof. And that was very fantastic. And that gives me hope for a future for my children and also for future generations. And this leads me to the, my final remark, because really I think you may be the most overlooked and valuable population group. I was very pleased to hear that in Finland and, and many other places in Switzerland, the media has attention to seniors, because this is not what we re see in Denmark. I've put out so many articles to media, and and also, unfortunately, I've heard from other people that it is more difficult to get the media attention in Denmark when you're a senior and you're young. All the youth, they have, it's much more easy for them to, to get media attention. Most of you are political, I guess, many of you are political engaged, but I still wonder why you are the one knocking on the politicians' doors. It should be the politicians knocking on your doors. Because you are the most crucial group in driving the green transition, you play an essential role in leading the way in climate engagement and demonstrating sustainable living to others. I think one of you said, we also have the time. Yes, that's right, but also you have the economy and you are a big number in, in population. So that's why I find seniors very, very important. Also, I have realized and seen the proof of how much you are engaged and what you do and what you are capable of. So I really hope with this conference and with us together and also probably meeting again, hopefully, and also that you are, uh, you are making a European group as well. I think this is something that the politicians, they cannot avoid. They cannot overhear us. Um, because I think, of course, the young people, they are very, very important. But they cannot do it without you or I, the grown-ups. I think in Norway they say, what's the word for seniors in Norway? Gott voksne, is that right? Is anybody from Norway? Gott voksne, I would just love this word. <laughs> uh, because I've had a little bit troubles with the word seniors, but it's like, it's like saying every seniors are the same, of course, you are not. But thank you so much. And please stop calling you boomers. This is something they do in Denmark still. And I'm very tired of hearing this boomer word. We should give greater attention and greater recognition to your contributions to the Green Agenda and seek broader approval for your efforts. This is my opinion, and I'm quite sure a lot of other people feel the same. That was it. That brings me to the end of the speech. I welcome any of you to come and approach me during the break, so when we go on the trip tomorrow, I have, um, I would very much uh, like to talk more to you and also when we get back. And if any of you are interested in one of the books or some of the results from Denmark, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kira. Uh, now we'll go to a very short panel discussion because we are a little bit running out of time. So I would like to ask the last three uh, presenters, that is Beata from uh, Landsamp uh, Pensionista, uh, Andrew Kroglund from Norge, or Kira, to just stand here for maybe five minutes. And I have some questions already. Kira, you are joining us, right? So uh, it's just the same system as before. Uh, let's say what time is it? Yeah, it's, it's getting late. Um, but we will do our best. Maybe we'll cut down the group work a little bit as well to save some minutes. But you know, uh, we haven't been very active on Slido, but there are some questions there. And I'll start with the most popular one. Uh, do we think it's an advantage to have many small groups or organizations or one large, one large group and higher numbers? It doesn't matter if you are like united in one huge group in a country or if you have small spread out groups all over the place or it's just the same. Mm. 
Well, I'm, I, you know, in Norway, okay, we, we have a large organization and we have 17, or almost 20 branches. Both are important. The local branches are important locally because they give credence to our cause and they are active in their local environment, whereas the central office is important towards the national press, politicians, larger manifestations, stuff like that. So, you know, both, both are important. Uh, do you have any comments on this? Many small or one large? We are a very small organization, uh, which I said in my speech. Uh, we are uh, an umbrella organization, and we have uh, 16 members with uh, around uh, 1,700 uh, members in these small organizations. And we have uh, nothing to do with the env environmental but uh, that is why we are here to learn mm -hmm. and get some ideas. I, I, and I am a, a, a journalist myself, so I am going to the press after this. Yeah, but not before, but after this. So we are going to do a lot of these things when we return to Fair Islands. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just go directly to the, to the next question. Do we think elder generation are getting more active in climate issues than it, they were before? The older generations, let's, let's call, it, call it that. I think they are. This is yeah. what we're experiencing in Denmark. And also getting new people to join this agenda as well. Just, I mean, people that are not uh, activists, that, not, that don't consider themselves being activists, we can see they're joining. They're joining forces now. So I think they are more active on this agenda as well. Mm -hmm. Why, Absolutely, why it's, it's, it's just a matter of fact in the sense that there are the demographic trend is more elder people in society. They have a higher degree of education than they used to have. So there are a lot of knowledgeable persons. Obviously, the issue of climate and nature da damage is becoming more important, and in that sense, they are you know more interested in becoming active. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Anything to add, uh, Beata? No, that's the same for us, but uh, nearly every day we get uh, some new members, elderly people, so we are very glad for that. Mm. Any questions from, from you guys out there? If not, we'll just end this very short. Yeah, Stefan. Yeah, the question is if you see any benefits in, in collaboration between these uh, amazing groups, as, as Stefan mentioned, there are more Stefans than me in here. So, uh, do we see uh, benefits in more collaboration between these group uh, between the Nordic countries? Just very short. Definitely. And also, it has been very inspiring to hear all of your uh, very good um, the stories about how media uh, are very active in other countries. So definitely, I think it would be very nice to, to join forces on that. Should, should we have a Nordic network, something like that? Yeah, it's important. I mean, if we can tell people back home, both ordinary people and politicians, that we are part of an international movement, we have a Nordic network, we have a European network, then they pay more you know, uh, attention to us. It, it, you know, strength in numbers is important. Being international is important. That's the way the whole climate issue has been, you know, developing from 1992 in Rio and all the climate conferences, getting together, becoming a global action network. Mm -hmm. We are uh, cooperating with a um, Nordic uh, association, uh, which is called uh, NSCO. And we, twice a year, we have meetings around the Nordic uh, uh, countries. Uh, in the beginning of May, May this year, we were in Reykjavik. And uh, in November, now in the last of next month, October, we are going to uh, Sweden. And uh, on May next year, we are going to Denmark, I think so. 
Norway, Norway, and uh, yes, we we have a lot of of uh, uh, cooperating with other uh, elderly organizations mm. in the Nordic. So, so I, I, to summarize, there are, there are some benefits, definitely some benefits, uh, by collaborating between countries, and there are signs that it's already being done to some extent. Okay, anything to, any very last comment before we go to the group work? No, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have to carry on. We are, we are a bit behind schedule now. Uh, precisely speaking, we are uh, some 20 minutes behind. So maybe we can uh, shorten the group work somewhat. It's not, it's not easy. But I, I'll, I'll start by explaining. I'll explain the group work. To start with, we have, si we have six tables. And we, have, we, that is me and Ingaloa, we have decided who's going to sit at what table because we want, we want you to mix up. We don't want only women or only Icelanders to occupy one table. So we are trying to mix up uh, different countries and men and women as, as well as we can or as well, yeah. Actually, Inga, Ingaloa has done all the work. I'm, I'm only one speaking, you know. That's, that's how it works. Um, so... Let's, I'll first explain the tables. This is table number one. But I'll show you who is going to sit there. This is table number two. Back there, three, four, three, four, no, two, three, four, five, six. We are using all of them. So we are approximately five people, at, or you are, uh, approximately five people at each table. And now I'll show you who is gonna, how, how you sp split the, the group. Group one with, with Kira Gilling as a group leader will be here. I'm leader. You're a leader? Yeah, yeah, group five. Uh, no, group. no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, ta table one. Are you Yeah, 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 yeah. The group leader is written in green. So Kira is coming to this table, number one. And uh, you will see the name of the others. Uh, Matti Numelin will take over the table two. Uh, Beata Samuelson will take over group, uh, uh, table three. Table four is Jorun Erdla, so you will move back to this table. Table five is uh, Iris Kaliola, over there, and table six is Birna uh, Sigurna Stoltin. Sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing, I'm mixing. Uh, I'm doing mistakes all the time, sorry. Group one, Kira Killing is here. Group two, Matti Numelin is there. Group three, Andrew Kroglund, sorry, Andrew. You are there. Group four, uh, Eric Elvers. You are back there. Group five, Birna Sigurðardóttir. You are there. And group six, Birna Sigurðardóttir over here. Did I get it right now? So you will, you will find your table. 